Zane and the Hurricane, A Story of Katrina, by Rodman Philbrick. Chapter 22 Leave a Message, Please So that was when I started to really get it, how one bad thing can lead to another. The first bad thing might be, say, a hurricane, and it crashes into the world and starts other bad things happening, like the power going out, and streets crashing homes, and then the levees fail, and the water rises. And suddenly a million other things are going bad all at once, and some people are suffering, and some are dying, and some are helping, and others are acting wicked superior and pleased with themselves like boss man with his shotgun, trying to make us all feel stu small and stupid. I figured they were all like that, the team of private security guards in matching green polo shirts and camel pants and shiny black combo boots. But as usual, I'm wrong, because we're a couple of blocks away, moving slow to keep pace with Mr. True, when one of them hurries to catch up with us. Hey, wait! I've got something for y'all. He holds out a bulky gym bag. Isn't much but what I could grab. Water, some canned goods like that. Melvina's face is as tight as a clenched fist. Oh, yeah, she says with a sniff. Now you're trying to help? Probably some kind of joke making fun of us. A bag of rocks or something. The man unzips the gym bag, revealing bottled water and tins of tuna and canned goods. The boss, he can be a real jerk, okay? Obviously, you're not criminal types, but he can't see it. He sees with Poe and Black, Mr. True says. The nice dude not, dot nods in agreement. Oh, yeah, he does. But the boss, he's right about one thing. This area is no place for strangers. We're not the only security team on the ground in this parish. There are others less disciplined. Trigger happy, you might say. Plus, some owners have holed up, armed to the teeth and intent on defending their property. Trust me, everybody is stressed. You don't have to be a looter to get shot on sight. Any stranger will do. Melvina goes, Why you work for a man like that if you ain't mean like him? The nice dude shrugs. It's a job. All I'm saying, keep moving. He turns to leave. Hey, wait up, Mr. True says, as if he just remembered something important. Got you a cell phone? And that's how I finally got to call, get to call my mom. The nice dude keeps looking behind him, worried about boss man, but he allows me to use his cell. The connection is full of static, and it never rings exactly, but suddenly my mother's voice is going, Zany, if that's you, leave a message, honey, please. Then a beep sending me to voicemail. I turn away to hide my tears, thinking, Zane Dupree, you total moron, you've been wanting to call home for two of the longest days that ever there were, and when you finally get the chance, you can hardly keep from bawling like a baby. Totally demented. But somehow I calmed down enough to leave a message on Mom's voicemail, which is that me and Vandy are okay, and this nice old guy, Mr. Trudell Manning, is helping us. Me and this girl, Malvina, and we got a canoe, and I'll call again as soon as we're someplace safe, and not to worry, and how... Sorry I am for being so dumb about everything. And then I can't talk any more, and Mr. True gently takes the phone and hands it back to the nice dude, who marches away without a backward glance. Bandy, catching on to my mood, pushes his nose against my leg, wanting to be petted, and that helps some. Also, Melvina starts cracking these lame jokes to make me laugh, and that makes it even better. Stupid stuff like, Why the teacher cross her eyes? She couldn't control her pupils. What you call a train loaded with gum? A choo-choo train. Why do dogs run in circles? Cause it hard to run in squares. Why the turkey crossed the street? Cause he wasn't a chicken. Bandy gets pretty excited hearing us laugh, and somehow I let go of the rope around his collar. He's off like a shot. Legs a blur as he races back to the big house, like he can't wait to return to the scene of the crime, barking like a maniac as if to let them know he's coming. I try to make a grab for that skinny yellow rope, but Mr. True grips me by the arm hard enough to hurt. No, he says very firm. Keep by me. They'll shoot Bandy. Might shoot you, he says, then adds gently. Dog will come back on his own, see if he don't. Bandy streaks on like a ground-hugging missile, the rope flapping from his collar. He skids past whatever he's headed for, kicking up clods of grass and dirt, then he picks something up in his grand mouth and races back and drops it at Mr. True's feet. Pretty good dog, he admits, picking up his battered top hat. 
I wrap Bandy's rope around my wrist and vow never to drop it again, hat or no hat. By now, Mr. True is limping so bad he's got no choice but to rely on me and Malvina for balance. She's dragging the gym bag of goodies. I've got the dog, and Mr. True is leaning on her shoulders. We're keeping to the middle of the street so nobody can accuse us of trespassing. He advises us not to look at the boarded-up houses we pass along the way. You see a crazy man in the street? You don't meet his eye, lest he throw his fear on you, Mr. True explains. Same thing applies in this case, except the crazy men are hiding inside their own homes, intending to shoot anyone comes too close or looks too interested. We get back to the canoe, we gonna stick by the flooded area from now on. Uh-huh, Melina says. Gonna find you a foot doctor, too. He doesn't respond to the suggestion exactly, but he doesn't fight it either. I'm tending to the notion of Algiers, he says, changing the subject. We'd have to cross the river, with the dangerous currents and all. But I got this cousin in Algiers. Belinda? Her fate, her place might be dry. It higher where she at. I know that much. Ain't seen her in some time. We're both busy and all, but we are on good terms. Whatever you say, True, that's what we're going to do. Takes a while, but we make it back to where the houses aren't quite so big, and the ground leaks water at every step, and crazy sounding dogs are still hauling off in the distance. Back to where we pulled the canoe out of the water. We can see the skid mark to make it made in the soggy grass as we came ashore. What we can't see is the canoe, because it's gone.